Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We know that God is going to meet us in this time, and so we are so glad that you are participating in worship with us. We'd love to know that you are here and worshiping with us. So if you would take a moment and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will be on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and let us know how we can be praying for you this week. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Holy and loving God, thank you that through the death of Jesus, you have put to death our old selves. Now, through Jesus's resurrection, you are resurrecting us to a new life. Help us to live as those who have been brought from death to life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello Church, I'm Eun Siu Gang, one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us a new day and a new life. As we gather for worship with the power of your Holy Spirit, reveal your presence in our midst. Open our minds to the truth of your story. Open our hands to welcome the risen Christ among us. Open our eyes to your glory, a glory reflected in the faces around us. God of faithfulness, as we get closer to you today, stir our hearts to continue to seek after you. We want to know more about you. We want to be more aware of your presence in our lives. We want our characters to be conformed to your will. Please know that our doubt and questions are our seeking you, not our seeking some random knowledge. Give us the spirit of revelation to know you more completely so that we might be transformed by your will saying, you are my Lord and my God. O oh Lord, you are a God who hears our voices. You are a God who answers our prayers. So now we pray for the world and community. We pray for family and friends, for those who are facing tough times. And now we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour your grace, hope, and comfort. Strengthen our faith this day that we may go forth as witnesses of your love. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's grace and God's generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website or by mail. Let us continue to worship our God. friends, I'm Pastor Eun Seo. How are you today? I'm so happy to spend this time with y'all. I have a question for you. Have you ever missed out on something? Maybe a birthday party you couldn't go to or a soccer game you couldn't play because you were out of town. Well, this question reminds me of something that I um, would uh, quite a lot miss when I was in your age. So I'd be with a bunch of people and I would be thinking about um, something and while everyone would be talking and then everyone would laugh. So I was so curious, but because of I was not paying attention, I couldn't know why they were laughing. So I would ask someone, hey, what happened? Why are you laughing so much? But they would be laughing too much and to tell me. So I would feel very upset, but it was my fault. I was not paying attention. 
So likewise, there is one Bible story, and there is a pretty much the same thing happened to the, the one of the disciples um, of Jesus. Well, Jesus had told the disciples to stay together after he was crucified. So that is what the most of the disciples did. They stayed together. But one of Jesus' disciples, Thomas, did not do listen. So Thomas did not stay together with the other disciples. So when Jesus showed up to the other disciples, Thomas totally missed seeing resurrected Jesus. And when he found out what he missed, he said to the other disciples, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you saw the resurrected Jesus. But guess what? He learned something from his mistake. After his mistake, he decided to pay better attention to what Jesus told him to do. So Thomas stayed with the other disciples again. And then he had a second chance and so resurrected Jesus. It is pretty cool, right? So the same thing that was true for Thomas is the same true for us. We too are invited to follow Jesus together. And we too are invited to learn what Jesus taught together. And then should we forget or let our attention wander, we are given second chance to learn about and uh, get to know more about Jesus. And this is the good news for today. So everyone, let us try to pay attention what Jesus is telling us today. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us a chance to know about you. Help us to remember and help us to learn about you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm really glad you've taken time to worship with us today. We're in the midst of a sermon series here in the Sundays after Easter where we're looking at times when the disciples met the resurrected Jesus. And so this, of course, is after his death, after his resurrection on the original Easter Sunday, and he's making appearances uh, to his disciples. And we've got a really interesting story today, as you just heard from the children's sermon, where uh, Thomas had missed an earlier um, possibility of seeing Jesus, and he's, uh, he's, he's not exactly sure that he can believe um, this story that Jesus might be actually come back from the dead. So let's jump into the scripture. It's uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, for those of us who have not seen and yet come to believe, we ask for your blessing. And I pray that you will open up our hearts and minds today, that you might speak to us anew. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if I were to mention the names of certain disciples to you and ask you to say out loud the first word that came to your mind, it's unlikely you'd all come up with the same words. For instance, if I were to mention the name of Judas, 
many of you might think, oh yeah, betrayed Jesus. But not all of you would start with those words. You might have thought of something else. If I were to mention Matthew, some of you would write down tax collector. But again, not all of you would start with that. If I were to mention the names James and John, some of you might think, oh yeah, sons of thunder. But not all of you would think that. And yet, if I mention the word Thomas, there's a little question about the first word that would come to your mind. It's probably going to be doubting. Indeed, so closely have we associated Thomas with this word, we have coined a phrase to describe him as doubting Thomas. You may be interested to know that in the first three Gospels, we're told absolutely nothing about Thomas. It's only in John's Gospel that he emerges as a distinct possibility, excuse me, personality. And even there, there's only 155 words about him. Not a lot about this disciple in the Bible, but today's story is not the only scene where he emerges. Earlier on in John, when Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem, the disciples thought that that was crazy. They thought it would be certain death for them all. Surprisingly, it was Thomas who said, then let us go so that we may die with him. Now, that is brave. That is a courageous statement. So why don't we call him Courageous Thomas? Yet we don't remember him for that. We also fail to point out that in today's story of Thomas' doubt, we have the one place in all the Gospels where the divinity of Christ is bluntly and unequivocally stated. It's interesting, is it not, that the story that gives Thomas his infamous nickname is the same story that has Thomas making the most earth-shattering confession of faith in all the Gospels. Look at his statement. My Lord and my God. He didn't call him rabbi or king or even Messiah, but God. The only place where Jesus is called God without a qualification of any kind. It's uttered with conviction, as if Thomas was simply recognizing a fact, like saying two plus two is four, or that the sky is blue. You are my Lord and my God. Certainly not the words of a doubter. So why don't we call him Faithful Thomas, or Super Smart Thomas, or Revelatory Thomas, or Thomas the Confessor? I like that one. Unfortunately, history has remembered him for a scene where the resurrected Christ made an appearance to all the disciples except for Thomas. Thomas was not present the first time Jesus appeared to the disciples. He missed out. And when he heard about the event, he refused to believe it. Maybe he was the forerunner of modern-day cynicism. Maybe the news sounded simply too good for him. Thomas said, unless I feel the nail prints in his hands, I will not believe. But the story doesn't end there. The next time Jesus made his appearance, Thomas was present with the disciples. And this time he too witnessed the event. This time he believed. So what can we learn from the life of Thomas? Well, first, that Jesus did not blame Thomas for doubting. I think that's important. So often the church's handling of doubt is to couple it with disbelief and to squash it. Some churches teach that it's wrong to doubt. But Jesus never condemned Thomas. I think he understood that once Thomas worked through his doubts, he would be one of the surest disciples of all. I must admit, I'm a little dubious myself of people who say they never have any doubts, people who always seem so sure of everything. I would suggest to you that any person who places themselves beyond doubt places themselves even above Christ. For on the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? At that given moment, even Jesus had doubts. Even Jesus asked why. Authentic faith always begins with intellectual honesty, and doubt is the bedrock of honesty. Let me put it another way. Faith is not the absence of doubt, it is the overcoming of doubt. I've had my doubts. I've wondered where God was when I haven't had my prayers answered right away or to my satisfaction. But then I'm reminded that it was Alfred Lloyd Tennyson who said, 
There lives more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. So we find ourselves crying out along with the disciple of old, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I think Thomas seems tailor-made for our skeptical age. I know a lot of folks who are hesitant to accept the Christian faith simply because they cannot accept what they cannot see. They've seen too many people who've been conned and they don't want to be rubes at the county fair walking around with eyes wide open and with wallets hanging out of their pockets. They don't want to be gullible and taken advantage of, so they're skeptical. Unless I see, I will not believe. But it's a normal reaction. You or I might have felt the same way as Thomas. Actually, I don't think doubt's a bad thing. There can be no true faith without it. Accepting something without examining, examining it is merely taking the easy way out. It's refusing to think or to look beneath the surface of life. Many times it's just plain intellectual laziness. Someone once said, some people think, others think that they think, and the rest would rather die than to think. I have no worries about those who have examined the Christian faith from every possible angle. I do worry a little about people who believe it's so far beneath them that they can't even think about it. We all have doubts. The actor and director Woody Allen may have been right. Faith would be easier if only God would show himself by depositing a million dollars in a Swiss bank account in our names. <laughs> yeah. Why did God do something spectacular like that? We can sympathize with British philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell, who was once asked what would he say if after death he found himself confronted by God. Russell replied, I shall say to him, why did you make the evidence of your existence so insufficient? We all long for certainty. A giant comet, perhaps streaking across the sky with its tail skywriting on our behalf, I love you, signed God. Why doesn't God do that? It should be easy. Of course, if that happened, immediately a group of cynics would get together and explain to us that it was just some freak accident resulting from certain atmospheric conditions. Why does God not reveal his existence more forcibly? Probably because he doesn't want to overwhelm us. If God's aim is to produce mature spirits fit to spend eternity in his presence, it makes sense that he would not reveal himself and his fullness to us. Such certainty would keep us perpetually immature. If a child knows that his parent will always be there to solve every problem, to resolve every crisis, to get him out of every scrape, the child will never develop self-reliance. Our insecurity may be essential to spiritual growth. All of us, when we are honest, must admit to having doubts. And doubt's not necessarily a bad thing, especially today. Which brings me to something rather bold, I'd like to say. I think our age, if anything, suffers not from doubt, but from overbelief. It seems to me that we could use a good, healthy dose of Thomas's skepticism. It almost seems that today, in the information age, we are ready to believe anything that comes down the pike. And the weirder, the better. I'm continually amazed at the wild things people believe nowadays. From the earth is flat, to crystals that are magic, to eclipses that bring along a sign of the rapture. Bishop Will Williman tells of talking with a member of what he called one of the stuffiest churches one time. This woman talked with him while peering out from under a gold cardboard pyramid. Why are you wearing that on top of your head, he asked. Because I'm a bit depressed today. It lifts me up, she said. What if you're not depressed, he asked. Then I wear a silver one. Okay. The word doubt derives from the Latin word debito, which literally means seeming to be two. So that etymologically, to doubt is to be of two minds, to stand at the crossroad, to look in two directions. Many people don't seem to have looked in any direction these days but merely accept blindly whatever is handed to them, especially if it comes from their favorite news channel or internet website. 
I swear, if I read one more fake conspiracy or another news story that contradicts actual facts, I'm going to scream. So I connect with Thomas. But I don't think he should be known for his doubt as much as his belief. I find it significant that the highest confession of faith in Jesus that we find in any gospel comes from this so-called skeptical disciple. Because doubt can lead to faith. And boy, did he have reason to doubt. He had seen his friend and mentor hung on a cross just days before. Only those who've had their faith shattered by the hammer blows of adversity, only those who've had their own personal calvary, only those who've seen real pain and loss can get to the other side and experience resurrection. Y'all, we can't get to Easter without passing through Good Friday. It's easy to have faith when things are going well. Problems don't loom on the horizon. Real faith is betting your life on God when that bet seems more foolish than playing the lottery. Thomas is not a villain. He's a model for most of us. In his story, we discover that Christ comes to meet us in the midst of our shattered and broken world of doubt and despair. For he knows our doubts, and Christ comes to us anyway. Some of you may know the name Charles Spurgeon. He was a great Baptist preacher in the late 1800s. And Spurgeon writes of going to live in Newcastle, England, which at the time was a very dirty industrial town. I've been to Newcastle. I found it to be actually very pretty, but it still carries a reputation for being a blue-collar manufacturing town. The story goes that Spurgeon was looking around a particular house that he was thinking about renting. And the landlord took him to the uppermost room to look out the window. There, he said, as he pointed out the window, he said, over there, you can see Durham Cathedral on a Sunday. Sunday? Spurgeon questioned. Why only on Sunday? Because, said the landlord, the furnaces are not working on Sundays, and there's no smoke, and therefore, you can see farther. You know, when we come to worship On Sunday morning, we come to see farther. When we gather in worship, we come to see into the heart of God. I want to say something to you this morning, and in doing so, I say it to myself as well. There are times in our lives when we face grief or disappointment or pain or depression. There are times when these things happen so that our hold on God falters just a little. When these moments of true, deep doubt come, I want to urge something upon you. It was something that was once told to me, and it's gotten me through many dark nights. And if you remember nothing about this sermon today, please remember this thought. Never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. I'm going to say that again. Never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. I say this because it's in moments of spiritual light that God shows us true reality. And you've got to remember what's real. After examining the facts that God has brought to light, remember those facts when things get dark. These moments of spiritual light are so very important because they allow us to get through the many dark nights of the soul that come into our lives Every single one of us at some point or another. For instance, in moments of light, God has told you that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Don't ever doubt that in the darkness. In moments of light, God has told you that the very hairs of your head are numbered. That's how well he knows you. Don't doubt that either. In moments of light, God has told you that he will never desert you. Please don't doubt that. And in moments of light... God has told you that resurrection is reality. Don't ever let the darkness cause you to doubt that. The disciple Thomas wasn't a bad guy for doubting in the dark. But in the light, Jesus revealed himself to him. And that led Thomas toward a stronger faith and a better understanding than all the other disciples. 
may it be so for us too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, it is true. We all stumble. We all struggle. We all go through the valley of the shadow of death. But you have told us in the light of day what is real. Help us to hold to the truth and to cling to it in our moments of darkness. Help us to remember that resurrection is real. That there is a new day coming. Lord, in the midst of our doubt, help our unbelief and help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thomas wasn't a bad guy. He just needed to see for himself. And once Jesus revealed himself in the light, it changed Thomas' life. He was the one to say, my Lord and my God. He was the first one. What about us? In the midst of our doubt, can we remember what is real and make that same confession? My Lord, my God. Let's hold on to that, to what is real, to what is true to what we have been taught in the light of day to get us through the darkness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.